Okay, good evening everybody. You can hear me okay? So um, I'm absolutely amazed that many of you had heard this the first time and chose to come back to hear it a second time. So thank you for your repeat visit. I'm going to cover some old ground, but it's been a year since we talked about this particular issue. So most of the content that you'll hear this evening will, will be new. Um, this particular image of Theresa May in Edvard Munch pose is not part of the women's series in 2020. It's just an unfortunate coincidence during the course of, of this evening. Now, I've decided to call this evening's lecture Brexit, The Nightmare Continues, in part because irrespective of which part of the conversation you adhere to, whether you are someone who agrees with the proposition that the UK is better off leaving the European Union, or whether you feel that the UK should remain as part of the European Union, the reality is most people in the United Kingdom want this to come to an end. They have grasped onto the notion that this has become a national nightmare that is entirely distracting from other urgent national priorities. Whether they are domestic priorities, such as tackling the dearth of finance going into the public services, whether it's the crisis in homelessness, whether it's the need to bring austerity in the UK to an end and invest in the future, or whether it's the role that Britain plays in the wider rule, a world. This is taking up all of the political oxygen. And so everybody within the UK, irrespective of where they sit, are hoping that this particular issue will come to an end. As you'll get from my presentation this evening and our subsequent conversation, I have a sense that this issue is now beginning to draw to a close. And we will see within 2020, I think, part of this ending and a new phase in it beginning. Now, since we uh, spoke last time, there has been a number of very important developments outlined here on this particular slide. The first is Brexit has been delayed already twice. The UK was originally set to leave the European Union on the 29th of March. They were then scheduled for a Halloween departure at the end of October. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, famously said he would rather die in a ditch, that's a direct quote, than remain in the European Union a minute longer. He is not dead in a ditch. He is actually running for re-election on Thursday, but the UK has not left the European Union. So it has been delayed twice. One Prime Minister has lost her job, Theresa May. She, of course, was the second Prime Minister overall to lose her job because of this issue, the first being David Cameron, who fought the referendum, lost the referendum, and on the morning the result was announced, decided to depart. In addition, there has been a withdrawal agreement and what's called a political declaration negotiated between the UK and the European Union, and it has failed in Parliament four times. The Theresa May version of that deal was rejected by Parliament three times, and the Boris Johnson revised version of that deal passed Parliament, but then he pulled it from Parliament. So it also failed to go through Parliament, but on this occasion, it did seem like there were enough votes for it to go through Parliament and become enacted into law. In addition to that, you may have noticed that there was a suspension of Parliament. The Prime Minister invoked the Queen's authority to, call, to prorogue Parliament, as it's known in the UK. The Supreme Court of the United Kingdom ruled that that was unlawful, that the advice given to the Queen was on a false basis and that Parliament should not have been prorogued. He has negotiated a new deal and now there's a general election happening on this Thursday, which will resolve at least some of the issues and create a landscape for how we get to a deal over the course of the coming months. If you're interested in this particular election, I very, very strongly suggest that you live stream the results coming in on the BBC website. That exit poll that pretty much gives you a sense as to how the election will be resolved is typically announced at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and the BBC do a terrific job of covering uh, the election results as they're coming, coming in. So all of this has happened since we, we last spoke. Now, one of the things that um, we always have to grapple with when we're talking about uh, Brexit is the fact that it is extremely complicated and confusing. And I like to think of it by drawing upon this famous quote from Winston Churchill. Churchill, of course, was talking about Russia at this particular moment, but he famously said that <coughs> Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And Brexit is similarly confusing. It's very difficult to understand how and why it happened. It's very difficult to understand what the current situation is in terms of the negotiations, the political attempts to resolve the issue. And there's a fog surrounding what might now come next in terms of the future of the UK and the future of the European Union without the UK. So during the course of this evening, what we're going to try to do is unravel the riddle, the mystery and the enigma. Uh, 
With regards to the riddle, we're going to talk about what the EU actually is. It's still fascinating to me that the morning after the referendum result in the United Kingdom, the number one search on Google was, quote, what is the EU? So the reality is most people don't actually understand what the European Union is. It was mentioned at the outset that I teach courses on European integration, and it's fascinating to me how few people at a postgraduate level studying European integration actually don't understand where the EU comes from, how it originates, how it works, and what value it offers to European citizens, and I would argue the global community. So we're going to look at that, and we're going to ask ourselves, why did the UK decide to leave? Looking at the arguments that were very clear, and also looking at the arguments that were a little bit more opaque, but perhaps a lot more influential in deciding the result. We're then going to look at the mystery. What is the current status of Brexit, and where do we go from here over the course, let's say, of the next 12-month period? And then finally, we're going to look at the enigma. And what I really want to focus on there are the consequences, potentially, of Brexit. But more importantly, what can we learn about our own country and about global affairs as a consequence of interrogating Brexit? Because the reality is, many of the things that have driven this vote in the UK are a consequence of global trends. They were not a direct result of citizenry in the UK objecting to the common agricultural policy of the European Union, or objecting to the institutional balance between the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers. The population did not know about these things. What they were doing was reacting in a knee-jerk fashion to things that were affecting them in their daily lives, some of which are related to the EU, many of which were not. So let's start with what is the EU and why did we vote to leave? Um, I want to start by reminding everybody that today is International Human Rights Day, which celebrates this, the most important and the most beautifully written document, I would argue, in human history, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted on the 10th of December, 1948, under the leadership of Eleanor Roosevelt, with a multinational committee who had drafted this particular document, and of course, the UN General Assembly that adopted the document. Now, this particular text on the slide is taken from the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the important phrasing in here is the one related to barbarous acts. Because one of the reasons why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted, and one of the reasons why the European Union was founded, is because Europe had launched two global wars within the first 40 years of the 20th century, resulting in close to 100 million people being killed right around the world. Violent conflict had plagued Europe for centuries. This is a timeline that I often find fascinating. You'll see in the black spaces the years where major powers in Europe, those major powers who gave rise to the European Union, were in conflict with each other. And it is no accident that the longest period of peace since 1600 on continental Europe has coincided with the creation of a cross-continental body that allows for the peaceful resolution of disputes and conflicts, that puts vital strategic natural resources under common control, that creates a space of common prosperity, that creates a sense of shared future. It's no accident that the longest period of peace coincides with that. So it's very, very important for us to remember that the origins of the European Union are not about trade, they're not about movement of people, they're not about agricultural policies, they're about the difference between the image on the top right which is the Reichstag in Berlin in 1945, when famine was ripe all over Germany, and the picture on the bottom right, which is the Reichstag today, the home of the Bundestag, and the center of power for one of the most sustainable and stable democracies in the world. The purpose of the European Union was to ensure that we would no longer have Europe-wide conflict leading to global conflict. It was an exercise in peace and reconciliation, and that particular exercise has actually been honoured by the, receiving the Nobel Peace Prize a number of years ago. This is the map of the European Union as it exists today. It started in the 1950s with a small body of six countries, primarily France and Germany as the engines of European integration but with the Benelux countries, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, and Italy joining in this initial collaboration. Now, over the course of the years, there have been successive enlargements of the European Union as they are known. In 1973, the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Denmark joined. In 
In the 1980s, Greece, Spain and Portugal joined. By the time we get to 1995, Sweden, Austria and Finland decided to join, bringing us up to 15 member states. And then in the early part of this century, after the fall of communism, 10 candidate countries in Central and Eastern Europe, starting with the Baltic Sea states in the north, um, all the way coming down through Poland, Hungary uh, and so on, joined the European Union as well. As was mentioned at the outset, when I worked in Brussels, it was my job to go into municipalities in Central and Eastern Europe and prepare those municipalities for joining the EU and implementing EU law. Now, the fact that the European Union has grown over time is in part a reflection that it is an attractive proposition for countries but it's attractive in different ways. So for example, France and Germany, their original goal was of course to try and find a way to reconcile and to have peaceful resolution of their disputes. Other countries have joined for different reasons, however. Ireland was at the time in the mid 1970s known as the poorest rich country in the world. It was a country that lacked infrastructure. It was a country that lacked competitiveness in its industries. It was a country that lacked opportunity. It was a country that sent 50,000 people overseas annually because they couldn't find employment at home. So Ireland's reason for joining the European Union was to be part of a larger, larger economic entity that would help drive and stimulate economic development domestically. When you get to Greece, Spain and Portugal, they were coming out of fascist dictatorships the rule by generals that had plagued them since the end of the Second World War. And they saw joining the European Union as an exercise in democratization and stabilization. They wanted to join a common European entity that would help bed down infant democracies within those states. If you look at the Scandinavian countries, Finland's main motivator for joining the European Union was that the collapse of the Soviet Union had undermined its largest trading partner. And so for economic reasons, Finland needed to be part of a different single market that would again drive economic development. And then when you have the Central and Eastern European countries joining at the beginning of this century, part of it was about economics, but of course part of it was they wanted to be reintegrated in what they called the European family. So this has been an attractive proposition. And until this point, no country has ever wanted to leave. There have been countries who have refused to join, Norway being a notable illustration, but no single sovereign country has decided to leave the European Union. Now, misunderstanding the history is the first problem. The second problem is misunderstanding what the European Union actually is. And a lot of people tend to think of it as something akin to the United Nations, perhaps, or perhaps something akin to the World Trade Organization, a trading bloc or an international club. But in fact, the European Union is, and I've put essentially in parentheses here, it's essentially a federal state. The reason why I say essentially is because on certain policy areas like foreign policy or defense, those particular policy domains continue to rest with national capitals and the nation state continues to have sovereignty. But in the field that I work in, for example, environment and climate change, the European Union is a federal state. The decisions made in Brussels through the European Parliament, through the European Council, through the various institutions of the European Union, those decisions are made by European entities and then domesticated into law in the different member states. So this is far, far more than a club of nations. And you'll see on this slide, as of 2015, there was 135,000 different laws that had been created at the European level that are then domesticated and translated and implemented in the nation states, in cities, in towns and provinces all across the European Union. So this is a common architecture of law and norms and standards that has been built over six or seven decades. Far more complicated than simply the United Nations. The closest equivalent that I'm able to come to is if you were to imagine for a moment what would happen if New York decided to leave the United States of America. Because as with New York, the United Kingdom is the second largest economy in the European Union. It is a financial services hub and it's also a very important cultural hub. So this is not like somebody leaving a club. This is like secession. Now, what were the causes of the decision to opt for Brexit? I like to think of the reasons that were above the waterline and like any dangerous iceberg, the real damage is done by the things below the waterline. So above the waterline, we had, for example, arguments over sovereignty. The quote was, take control back. In other words, too many decisions are being made in Brussels. We want to make decisions in our national parliament. 
quite ironic given that the government that decided to opt for Brexit is the government that decided to unlawfully shut down Parliament. Also quite ironic given that no decision is made in Brussels, no decision is made by the European Union without the involvement and consent of all member state governments. There is no mysterious elite sitting in Brussels that makes decisions instead of a national government because the decisions are made by what's called the institutional triangle. The European Commission as a civil service proposes policy. The European Parliament, which has members drawn from every member state, scrutinizes the policy, but ultimately the decision whether to enact or not goes to the European Council. And that means sovereign nation states like the United Kingdom. There is a complex voting mechanism within the European Council that allows policies to be adopted even if everyone doesn't consent. But as a matter of practice, very few European policies are adopted without the consent of all member states. And part of the reason for that is because the system that has been created is in spirit a consensual system. Nobody wants to leave another member state behind because they don't want to create an atmosphere of toxicity. So the idea around sovereignty was pretty much a misnomer. Then there was an issue about immigration. Over the course of many years, in fact over the course of decades, there has been a substantial change in the demographic, demographic makeup of the United Kingdom, with large numbers of immigrants coming in, not just from the European Union, in particular from those Central and Eastern European states, but also dating back to the 50s and 60s, large number of immigrants coming in from across what's known as the British Commonwealth, the previous British Empire. So large numbers of people coming in from South Asia, large numbers of people coming in from uh, various parts of the Caribbean, large numbers of people coming in from Canada, Australia, South Africa, and so on. So there has been a rejection of a multicultural pluralistic view in the United Kingdom, which was part of what I would argue one of the main drivers of the, the Leave vote. There was also an optimistic vision. Many people on the Leave side didn't just want to reject the European Union, they wanted to embrace a vision of what they called Global Britain. In other words, Britain will be more prosperous if instead of depending on our near neighbours for our economic prosperity, we can return to the relationships we had with the rest of the Commonwealth and we can reach out for free trade agreements of our own that are not hampered by some of the social, economic and environmental safeguards that are consistent with the European Union as a project. There was also an argument about what's called the democratic deficit, the feeling that decision making within the European Union happens elsewhere and is controlled by a distant and unaccountable bureaucracy, as opposed to the need to have this more locally centred, not just in London, but in regional parts of England and of course in the devolved assemblies in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. But if you look below the waterline, a lot of things that you would think are not necessarily the types of drivers that should shape generations to come actually played a very important role. Complacency amongst the elite, the notion that, for example, everybody understands that the European Union is good for us, therefore why would anybody possibly vote to leave? The role of the media, a particular brand of right-wing virulent media that was constantly pushing the leave agenda, not just in the run-up to the referendum, but for years and decades before. Interestingly, the notion of personal ambition stands very, very tall as a driver of this issue. Is there's a very strong argument to make that Brexit would not have achieved the win that it achieved if it weren't for the backing of Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson, along with Nigel Farage and Michael Gove, three prominent politicians in the UK, were the faces and the most important advocates for Brexit. But interestingly, Boris Johnson had written two newspaper articles containing his views. One of those articles that he was minded to publish was, we should remain in the European Union. But his calculus was, the leave vote will not succeed. The vote will be to remain. But if I back leave, I will then become the darling of the centre and right of the Conservative Party and will become the de facto heir apparent to David Cameron as the next Prime Minister. So I often describe Brexit as an act of vandalism caused by personal vanity. One very important leader who decided that his career prospects were best shaped by backing one side of the argument. It's actually notable that when the leave result was announced that Boris Johnson was speechless and colourless when he faced the media, because I think it dawned on him at that moment, oh goodness, I'm going to have to now deliver on this. There was also an awful lot in terms of uh, party politics. 
the Conservative Party had decided as part of its election manifesto to have a referendum, but unfortunately, the lead opposition party in the United Kingdom, the Labour Party, had elected its own leader, who in theory was backing Remain, but in practice did not do very much to actually mobilise his core supporters in the referendum. And as a consequence, there was a vacuum amongst those core, um, core supporters, which allowed the Leave campaign to actually go in and exploit. So an awful lot of things that were bubbling below the surface, and we'll come back to some of these a little bit later when we're talking about consequences. So where does Brexit go from here? The referendum delivered a result, and that result gave a mandate to government and parliament. Now, the mandate that was given to government and parliament was very unclear. Theresa May used to say, Brexit means Brexit. But nobody has any clue what that actually means. In part because there are many ways to leave the European Union. Once you're on the outside, there are then many ways to structure a future relationship. And so this has become extremely complicated because the manner of leaving is complex. And what happens after you leave really determines not only the future economic strength or weakness of the United Kingdom, but the territorial integrity of the country as well. So essentially, you've got three dimensional um, problems to deal with. The first is the withdrawal agreement, which is known in common language as the divorce. How do you split? What type of settlement do you have to make? Second, the transition. How much time do you give yourself to negotiate a future arrangement? And what happens during this in-between moment? You're neither in nor do you have a future arrangement, but you need some sort of stability within the relationship in order to negotiate the future. That's the transition. And then thirdly, the future arrangements. Once the UK leaves the European Union, how close a relationship are these two now separate entities going to have? Are they going to have a free trade agreement? Are they going to trade with each other based on World Trade Organization rules? Are they going to be much closer than that? What type of arbitration should there be if there are conflicts between the future UK and the future EU? Should that arbitration be conducted by a European Court of Justice or some other type of body? So these are the three different elements that need to be considered. How we go about considering these three different elements are obviously subject to the whims of the calendar. So we're going to look at the calendar and we're going to look at some of these components. The first date to bear in mind is what happens on Thursday. This particular general election has been called uniquely and specifically because of Brexit. Because under the UK law, there's something called the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which means there was no general election scheduled until 2022, five years after the last election, which was in 2017. So in theory, there should not be a general election. But the reason why there is a general election is because the Conservative government could not get their Brexit deals through Parliament, as a consequence of various rebels in the Conservative Party voting against the different deals, the party lost its majority in the House of Commons. And as a consequence of that, the Prime Minister decided the only way to resolve this, the only way to have the majority in Parliament I need to get a deal through is to call an election. Now, of course, for the other political parties, this was also in theory quite attractive because for some of them who strongly advocate for Remain, there was a theory that they could capture the Remain voters and build their numbers in Parliament. And for the Labour Party, the chief opposition party, they felt they would be able to turn this conversation into public services and austerity and the future of the country over the coming decades and the end of nine years of Conservative rule. So they felt pretty good about setting up this election too. The result of this election, which will be known to us around 5pm on Thursday, is pivotal. Because depending on how this goes, we will know whether or not the withdrawal agreement can get through Parliament, by which date and with what consequences. Second date to bear in mind is the current scheduled departure date. So I mentioned earlier that Brexit has been delayed twice, March, October, and now there is a, an extension to the 31st of January. So we could have a scenario whereby the Conservatives win a majority on Thursday, they already have a deal negotiated, they now have the numbers to pass that deal, the deal is passed by the 31st of January and the UK leaves by the end of, of that month. That's a scenario. If the UK were to leave on the 31st of January, that then begins what's called the transition period. This moment when you get to negotiate the future arrangements. 
At the moment, that transition period is scheduled to end by the end of December of next year. It is highly unlikely that that will happen because, as I'll tell you later, trade deals typically take anywhere between two years, seven years, or even more than that. So the idea that the UK and the EU can negotiate their future arrangements within 12 months is quite fanciful. So the more likely scenario is that the UK will leave actually closer to the end of 2022. And that brings with it all manner of complications that we're going to get into. Now, I've already talked about the fact that this is a nightmare in terms of Brexit. The election is also a nightmare. And part of the reason why it's a nightmare is because there has been a massive upheaval in terms of party affiliations, in terms of voting intentions, in terms of how endorsements to different political parties might normally happen. So The Economist, for example, which many of you will know is one of the, the leading um, uh, weeklies dealing with politics and economics around the world, they've actually refused to endorse any of the political parties because they've reached a point where they've decided any of the main parties, they're endorsing the Liberal Democrats who have no chance of winning the election, but they've refused to endorse the Conservatives or, or Labour because they feel that the Conservatives are going down a Brexit path that will ensure ruin and the Labour Party is led by what they call a Marxist who will lead the country down a path to ruin. So the, uh, the choice facing the voters on, on Thursday is really an unenviable choice and it's causing an awful lot of difficulties in terms of mapping what the likely outcome will be. This is the most recent polling that we have and it suggests a 10% lead in the polls for the Conservative Party. It therefore suggests a majority for the Conservatives of anywhere between 20 and 70 seats, depending on how this national poll translates into voting intentions within the various constituencies across the country. Now this poll may be right, this polling of polls I should say, because it's an accumulation of multiple polls, it may be right. We may be seeing a Conservative majority on Thursday, but it may be wrong. One of the reasons why it may be wrong is because there has been a massive increase in voter registrations, particularly a young amongst people aged between 18 and 34. And in previous elections, those young voters have broken substantially by more than 60%, in fact, for the Labour Party. These polls track voter intentions based on how you voted last time and whether or not you plan to honour that same vote or switch. So it doesn't take into account the intentions of people who are recently registered. So that's one potential problem. A second potential problem is we don't know what's going to happen with so-called tactical voting. In other words, you may want to vote Labour, but you may see that the Liberal Democrats are closer to the Conservatives in your constituency. And so on this particular occasion, you're going to lend your vote to the Liberal Democrats and they might therefore win the seat and undermine some of the polling. So tactical voting is something that's really growing in popularity and is likely to be a factor on Thursday. There are all manner of different websites right now where you can type in your post code, your zip code, and based on that they will give you information on who is the leading candidate within your constituency and who you should give your vote to if you want to beat that leading candidate. Most of those tactical voting websites are aimed at ensuring that Boris Johnson does not get a majority. So we don't know. If I had to bet right now, however, I would say that the likely outcome is going to be a Conservative majority. And the reason for that is because the Conservatives and Johnson in particular have managed to coalesce and capture the bulk of those who voted Leave in the referendum. In part because his candidates are not facing opposition from the Brexit party formed by Nigel Farage. But on the Remain side, there has been no similar success in trying to coalesce around one party. And as a consequence, it looks like the Remain vote will be split in Scotland between the SNP, the Liberal Democrats and Labour, in England mostly between Labour and the Liberal Democrats, in parts of Wales between various parties. So it looks like one of the masterstrokes in this election has been the tacit agreement between Nigel Farage of the Brexit Party and Boris Johnson and his Conservatives to make sure that they are not competing for the same voters. Unfortunately for Remain, they have not been quite so politically astute on their side. So I think the likely scenario is going to be a Conservative majority. Now, I find that quite fascinating. And the reason I find that quite fascinating is because for the past nine years, there has been a process of austerity in the United Kingdom. 
there has been massive reductions in expenditure and investments in public services. There has been a rise in all manner of social ills, including homelessness and poverty. There has been the fiasco of the Brexit referendum and then the double fiasco of failing to honour the result of the Brexit referendum. There's a prime minister in charge who made his career through plagiarism. He has been fired as a journalist from newspapers for inventing stories. He was fired previously from government for lying about an affair. He has fathered multiple children with many wives and refuses to acknowledge those children. He unlawfully suspended Parliament and did one of the key things you're not supposed to do in the United Kingdom, which is mislead the Queen. He is a buffoon. But last night, for example, there was a very telling moment, an interview with a member of the public on one of the British news channels. And he said, basically in this election, I've a choice between a Marxist or a lying buffoon, and I'm going to choose the lying buffoon. <laughs> so it's, it's actually quite staggering to think that a government that by all, all intents and purposes, you could argue has reached the end of its natural shelf life. It's very unusual for governments to stretch so far. But in addition to reaching the end of its natural shelf life, for a government that has been unable to deliver on its key promise, for that government to now be heading for a better electoral result to the one that it had previously, that's quite interesting. And we'll come back to that when we're thinking about the United States in 2020. <coughs> okay, withdrawal. So what does withdrawal actually mean? The very, very simple illustration of this is that we're about to draw a mark across the English Channel, separating the United Kingdom from continental Europe. But it's actually much more than that. It starts with the withdrawal agreement. The withdrawal agreement is very long, it's very legalistic, it's very complicated. So I'm not going to go through it all in detail. But what I want to do is to just draw your attention to a couple of important provisions. First of all, there will be a transitional period. That transitional period, as I said, will likely run until the end of 2022. And during that period, the United Kingdom will need to abide by European rules without having any say whatsoever in how those rules are crafted. Again, extremely interesting because one of the main rallying cries was take back control. We want sovereignty. And yet now the United Kingdom is going to take, become what's called a rule taker. No role whatsoever in shaping the policy, but an absolute obligation to implement it. It will lose membership of all of the institutions, but it will also lose membership of the various funding mechanisms that are extremely important. For example, the types of funding mechanisms that help to drive research and innovation. Citizens' rights, however, will be enforced. This has been a major bone of contention right across these negotiations. What happens to the millions of people right across Europe who live in states that are not their own states of origin? So what happens to European nationals who live in the UK? And what happens to UK nationals that live in other parts of Europe? The agreement states that there will be a holding pattern for those citizens' rights during the duration uh, of the negotiations in the transition period. The UK will have to pay a divorce bill of 33 billion pounds. Just to leave the room, the UK is going to have to write a huge check, which again is very, very interesting because during the campaign, one of the rallying cries of the Brexit people was, we want to keep more of our own money. We're tired of sending this money to Brussels. Previously, when you sent that money to Brussels, an awful lot of it came back. But now 33 billion is going to be paid simply to leave. The reason for this is because the European budget is negotiated on seven year bases. In addition, many of the institutions of the European Union are decades in the making. So as a consequence, the UK has obligations to the budget and it has obligations to things like pension payouts. So this is the calculation that's been arrived at as a consequence of all of those pre-existing calculations. Both sides have agreed within the withdrawal agreement that they will work towards a free trade agreement. They will try to expedite that process. And they have said that they will try to ensure a level playing field. In other words, one of the fears amongst Remainers in the UK is that something that is currently called, quote, Singapore on the Thames will be created in the UK. In other words, all of the social and economic safeguards, all of the environmental protections, all of the workers' rights, that have been established at the European level for decades will be abandoned and the UK will create a different type of economy, a much more um, right-wing version of capitalism. 
what the withdrawal agreement says is that at least in the near term, that that won't happen, that there will be a level playing field and that the UK will adhere to these common standards that have been agreed over the course of many, many years. Now, perhaps the most important part of the withdrawal agreement, the most controversial part, the part that forced it to be rejected in Parliament on multiple occasions, the part that led to the loss of the Conservative majority, concerns something called the backstop. And the backstop relates to how Northern Ireland will be dealt with through these negotiations and within the future arrangements. Now, for those of you who don't know the United Kingdom, and I'm sure it's possible that some of you don't, because in American media, sometimes you hear the United Kingdom referred to as England. Sometimes you hear it referred to as Britain. The United Kingdom is actually four nations. It's the nation of Scotland, the nation of England, the nation of Wales, and Northern Ireland. Four nations within one state. Now, ideally, what the United Kingdom wanted to do, what the government wanted to do, is what I'm calling Exhibit A. In other words, there's a transitional period where the whole of the United Kingdom remains aligned to a certain extent up until the point where a new agreement is reached and the future arrangements are, are settled. When it became clear that that wasn't going to happen because of the various red lines that the UK government put in place as part of their negotiation strategy, what they then wanted is Exhibit B. They wanted the United Kingdom as a whole to leave the European Union one single entity departing the European Union. That was not possible, for reasons I'll get into in just a moment. So what we're ending up with is the middle arrangement, Exhibit C. This is really, really, really important because of this. Because you suddenly have the structural integrity of the United Kingdom compromised. You have Northern Ireland broken off from Great Britain, which is a geographic term, broken off from the mainland of the United Kingdom, and instead, as the rest of Britain, as the rest of the UK leaves the European Union, Northern Ireland, for all intents and purposes, temporarily at least, remains inside. So the whole of the UK legally leaves the EU Customs Union, but Northern Ireland stays in. This means that Northern Ireland keeps the same rules as the European Union, as opposed to the rules of the United Kingdom. Although the Northern Ireland Assembly gets some role in determining how and when this happens, they in fact don't get a vote on this for the next five years. And so this results in the fact that goods coming from mainland United Kingdom into Northern Ireland suddenly have to pay uh, taxes. That's important economically, but it's really, really devastating politically because there is a large block, up to 60% of the voting population in the Northern Ireland, who consider themselves British and consider this as being an absolute betrayal of centuries of integration between the four nations of the United Kingdom. They feel like they've been betrayed and they feel like they've been abandoned. And for those reasons, they denied their votes to the Conservative majority to back this deal. Now, this is one of the most controversial and one of the most consequential parts of the agreement because of the long history of the island of Ireland. If I meet somebody who comes from this side of the line, I can figure out their politics by listening to two words. If the person I meet calls that area behind the red line Northern Ireland, I have a sense of what their politics are and I have a sense of what their religion is. If on the other hand they say the North of Ireland, I again have a sense of what their politics and what their religion is. So we have a, a long history on this particular island going back 800 years. But the presence of that border has existed since the 1920s. And of course, the existence of that border led to all manner of troubles, a phrase you'll be aware of, that really escalated from the late 1960s through to the mid 1990s, resulting in the death of over 3000 people, resulting in all manner of carnage, not only within the six counties of Northern Ireland, but across the island and across the UK, and has been a dramatic hindrance to economic development throughout the whole region. The UK, for example, pours huge amounts of public money into Northern Ireland simply to keep the state viable. That red line is a border, but where I come from, it's referred to as the scar. That's what we call it, the scar. Because for us, it's a physical manifestation of a divide that should not exist. 
Now, of course, people on the other side of the border of a particular persuasion have a different and equally legitimate viewpoint. Peace was brought to Northern Ireland in the mid-1990s for all manner of reasons, but one of the principal reasons it happened is because the European Union was the guarantor between the major parties, and because as part of the Good Friday Agreement which settled the long-standing troubles, it was agreed that people living in Northern Ireland could have citizenship of either the United Kingdom or Ireland because they were part of a common European citizenry anyway. They were part of a common European Union. They had the same rights as everybody else living in the European Union. But the most important thing is the border infrastructure was taken down. That border used to be characterized by watchtowers and helicopters, by terrorists crossing the border back and forth, by arms dumps located in farms and fields, by graves located in farms and fields all around that area. And a very, very fragile peace has been brought and has been largely maintained over the course of the last two decades. There is no guarantee that that peace will fall as a consequence of the UK leaving the European Union. But it is alarming enough that the chief constable of policing in Northern Ireland has suggested that there is a strong likelihood of a return to violence as a consequence of Brexit and particularly as a consequence of any physical infrastructure that might go up along that border, which would reinforce once again the notion of separation. So this is very, very important because it is partly about infrastructure, it's partly about economics, but it's also an awful lot to do with symbolism. And if we get the symbolism wrong along this border, a very, very hard earned peace could very rapidly descend into violence once again. Now, one of the things that makes us quite alarmed about this is the viewpoint of the British government itself. And recently, the department in the British government that is in charge of Brexit has stated very clearly that the border will not be free of checks, in direct contrast to what the Prime Minister himself is, stay, is saying on um, the election campaign. But the department itself has says it will not be free of checks. And the reason for that is because if Northern Ireland remains in regulatory environment with the rest of the EU, meaning the rest of the island of Ireland, then anything coming into Northern Ireland inevitably has to be subject to customs checks and has to be subjected to different regulatory norms. It is inevitable. So we're really concerned about this because any return to infrastructure, even paperwork that suggests separation could be potentially hazardous for the whole island. Now, I've talked up until this point about a deal, the withdrawal agreement. There is, of course, an alternative to a deal, and that is no deal. In other words, the Conservatives might be elected on Thursday. They might not be able to pass their withdrawal agreement in Parliament for whatever reason. And as a consequence, they might simply leave the European Union without any deal at all. Again, very, very difficult to forecast what that might entail. It's speculative. But again, we can turn to the UK government's own assessment to figure out what the UK government thinks will happen as a consequence of no deal. And here's what they've suggested. They've suggested that a no deal scenario could be extremely damaging for the UK. It could result in things like reduced medical supplies. It could re result in higher food pr uh, prices and even food shortages. As a consequence of the UK being so enmeshed in European and even global supply chains. So these are some of the likely outcomes, and that's why one of the things that Parliament has been resolute on is rejecting the concept of no deal at every possible turn. And then finally, we get on to the notion of future arrangements. So the UK leaves, ideally it leaves with a deal. That deal then establishes a transition period, and during that transition period, future arrangements are negotiated. It is impossible right now to determine what that future arrangement might look like, because there's all sorts of different scenarios that could be followed. Some people within the British Parliament, for example, have suggested a deal along the lines of what Norway has. That would be a deal that maintains a very close economic relationship between the UK and the EU. So it is one with the least amount of economic dislocation. On the other hand, Norway follows all the European Union rules pays into the European Union budget, but has no say whatsoever in how European laws are crafted. So this would not really be Brexit. This would be far worse than the scenario right now. And those who truly believe in Brexit would legitimately feel cheated by this sort of arrangement. On the other end of the spectrum, you have something like Canada, 
which is a much looser free trade agreement. Doesn't cover all the different sectors um, and the types of economic dislocation would be substantially larger. Now, one of the things that's important to bear in mind is that the transition period as currently established does not seem to give enough time to ensure that future arrangements are properly developed. And so one of the open questions is, for how long is it politically and economically tenable for the UK to have a transition period where it is a rule taker before it gets to the point of having a deal with the European Union? Interestingly, on this particular slide, I've illustrated the duration on average of different types of trade deals that are negotiated. But the key point on this slide is that in addition to negotiating a new deal with the European Union, the UK has to now negotiate 50 more trade deals to cover all of the existing arrangements that it has as a member of the European Union with other countries around the world. So it not only has to concentrate its time on its future arrangements with the EU, it has to negotiate a free trade agreement, for example, with the United States. And one of the biggest controversies in the general election right now is what will President Trump and pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies and insurance companies in the United States want from a free trade deal? And what will that mean for the National Health Service in the UK, one of the most prized possessions of the British population? Will it mean, for example, that the freedom to set prices for generic drugs will go away and all of a sudden the prices of drugs in the UK will more match the prices of drugs in the United States? So it's hard enough to negotiate a trade deal with the European Union when you are now out on your own, one country negotiating against a solid block of 27. But when you're on your own as a market of 60 million, as opposed to a market of 500 million people, and you're having to negotiate with the US, with Australia, with the powers in the emerging economies markets, then you're in real trouble because you no longer have all these other countries and you no longer have the incentive of a 500 million person market to help your negotiation stance. One of the main arguments, of course, is um, why have future arrangements when we already have the best deal available? At the moment, the United Kingdom is pivotal in setting the rules of the European Union. It benefits from European Union membership. So why on earth would the United Kingdom leave? That's a question for other people. One of the things that I want to leave you with when thinking about what the current negotiations look like and where they might lead is that the prime soundbite of this particular election campaign in the United Kingdom has been the term, get Brexit done. Now, Boris Johnson um, should actually know better than walking out of a bus with lies on it because he has what's called previous when it comes to walking out of buses with lies on them. He famously rose to prominence within the Leave campaign because of the Leave battle bus that had statistics on it about how much money was going to be pumped into the National Health Service once the UK left the European Union. The sound bites and messages in that bus proved to be false. And equally, what I've tried to relay to you is the notion that this election gets Brexit done is a fantasy. Because the best case scenario is that the Conservatives return to office, the Parliament passes a withdrawal agreement by the end of January, and then the UK embarks on seven years of negotiations. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that the UK falls out of the EU now, or that the UK falls out of the EU at the end of next year without a deal, or it falls out of the EU on the uh, end of December in 2022 without a deal. So there is no hope that we're going to get Brexit done over the course of the next number of months. What we might do is another Churchillian phrase. This is not going to be the end. At the very, very best, it is the end of the beginning. Because getting out of the EU was always going to be nothing more than the first step. The much more important step is, what does the future relationship look like and how does that minimize damage? So then let's get to the issue of consequences before we begin to wrap up. Now again, I could very easily put in front of you statistics from all manner of research institutes and think tanks and academics and universities, but they would in a sense lack credibility because at least in the United States, not a single statistic is immune from controversy because it will be called a left-wing statistic or a right-wing statistic or a liberal or an evangelical statistic even, whatever you're going to call it. So I've deliberately chosen to only give you 
statistics, evidence that is coming from the British government itself. Not a single liberal think tank, not a single labor think tank. These are government assessments. So the government's own assessment is suggesting that economic growth will be 6.7% less as a consequence of this activity as opposed to what would happen if the UK stayed within the European Union. Now to put that into context, the Great Recession resulted in a 4% economic dip, not a 6.7% economic dip. So this is a massive, massive dislocation in terms of the economy of the UK. It also suggests from the government's own assessments that this will necessitate a 3% increase in borrowing and or slashing of public service investment. Now again, consider the context. Nine years of austerity, nine years of draining back public expenditure and investment in public services in order to recover from a financial crisis that required massive amounts of public money to bail out the banks. And instead of ending that nine years of austerity, you're actually doubling down on that austerity. Problematic. The economic dislocation is the reason why every single former living prime minister, conservative or labor, have all voted for Remain. Even Theresa May voted for Remain, but simply considered it her duty to put in place a Brexit withdrawal agreement to honor the referendum. But she voted Remain. David Cameron voted Remain. Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, John Major voted Remain. And in fact, many of those former prime ministers have actually been on television during the last week telling voters not to vote for their parties. John Major, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer, the major economic minister within the British government under Margaret Thatcher, and subsequently prime minister for seven years of a conservative government, he told people this week, do not vote for Boris Johnson. Unprecedented. Similarly, the last three conservative chancellors of the Exchequer have not only said that Remain is a mistake, but some of them have been thrown out of the Conservative Party and deselected as a consequence of arguing against leave. And the reason they've done this is because the mathematics, the arithmetic, simply don't add up. One of the unfortunate tragedies of all of this is that not only is there a national consequence economically to this particular departure, but those who voted most heavily leave are those who are hit first and most hardest. So if you see, for example, this particular part over here, the northeast of England, which has suffered major economic decline as a consequence of globalization, it's a center for manufacturing. It re relies enormously on global supply chains for things like the automotive industry. It's projected to have a 16% economic hit as a consequence of Brexit. Down here in the Midlands, again, a former center of manufacturing in the United Kingdom, a 13% economic hit as a consequence of Brexit. Now, in addition to the economy, we have to think of what happens to the UK state. One of the things that I find remarkable, because I never thought I would see it in my lifetime, is that a consequence, as a consequence of, excuse me, the backstop, there is now an active conversation going on about Irish reunification. And in fact, many people within the nationalist community in Northern Ireland are calling for a referendum on Irish unity. Believe me, the Republic of Ireland does not want Irish reunification because absorbing Northern Ireland into the Republic of Ireland would be the economic equivalent of West Germany absorbing East Germany. Not quite as bad as South Korea absorbing North Korea, but very, very substantial because of the amount of money public money that flows into Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom to support economic development in that region. But there is now an active conversation around Irish reunification because of the number that, that you see over here. 55% of the population of Northern Ireland voted for Remain and the unionist population of Northern Ireland feel betrayed because the British government have abandoned them and basically said, we in Great Britain on the mainland, we will leave, but you will stay. But second of all, and perhaps less surprising, is the fact that the First Minister of Scotland is now calling for a second independence referendum in Scotland. So in 2014, uh, there was a referendum. The independence movement in Scotland lost relatively narrowly. But as a consequence of how the debate has progressed over the last number of years, the election of 2015 resulted in almost all of the members of parliament in Scotland going entirely for the Nationalist Party. And now when you look at opinion polls, you see rising support for Scottish independence and a call for a second referendum. 
So again, ironic, given the call for sovereignty, that one of the long-term consequences of this particular endeavor might be the breaking up of the United Kingdom itself. There are also, of course, potential consequences for the European Union itself. One of the great fears was that there would be a populist surge in other parts of the European Union, and we do see some of that. We see populist governments in parts of Eastern Europe. We see a populist government, for example, in Italy, and we see a rise of populist parties in places like, for example, Germany. We also, of course, witnessed a number of years ago um, Marianne Le Pen rising in the polls and making the runoff in the French presidential election. So one of the things that we're seeing right across the continent is more anti-European sentiment and more of that anti-European sentiment flowing to both extreme left and extreme right parties. But in terms of some of these other things, they've actually been relatively mitigated. There was an idea initially after Brexit that UK departure would be very quickly followed by Dutch and then French departure. All of that has disappeared because every country is now pardon my language, scared shitless of leaving the European Union because they've watched the chaos unfold in the United Kingdom. So that particular issue has been put to bed for at least the time being. However, it is important to say that the European Union will be badly affected as a consequence of the UK leaving because it is so important financially, it is so important politically, and it is so important culturally. Ironically, many of the best things that have happened in the European Union over the last 30 years have happened as a consequence of British leadership. Leadership on climate change and environment originates with the United Kingdom as well as Germany and Scandinavia, but the UK was very influential. The development of the single market itself was really at the behest of Margaret Thatcher. So there's a sense in parts of Europe that the union is being orphaned by one of its most important parents. Now, one of the things I want to close with are what are the types of trends that have led to all of this that actually reverberate far above and beyond the borders of the European Union. And there's a couple of things that I think are very important, particularly if we think of the context of the United States. There has been a suggestion that the Brexit vote was a forerunner to the presidential election in 2016, and that the election on Thursday is a forerunner to what might happen in 2020. So people in political campaigns over here are watching Thursday very, 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 very closely. So one of the things that we can note, for example, is a rise in the distrust of elites. Over here we call it fake news. But during the Brexit referendum, Michael Gove, who was one of the leading advocates for Brexit, was confronted with the statistics from the IMF and the World Bank and the OECD that all said the economy would be ruined if you leave the European Union. And his exact response was, I think the British people are tired of experts. So there has been a backlash against experts, there has been a backlash against institutions, there has been a backlash against elites. Why that is the case is speculative, but I would argue that if you look at the United Kingdom and the United States, it's hard to escape the financial crisis and how people lost faith and trust in many parts of the establishment as a consequence of the financial crisis. It's impossible to overlook the war in Iraq and recall how people lost faith in the judgment of their politicians, not only because they made the wrong call, but because they made a call based on a series of lies. You can also look, for example, at the decline in traditional institutions like the church, the organized church, particularly the Catholic church. So there has been a massive rise in distrust in elites, and this particular problem is plaguing these other parts of Europe that are suffering from a populist backlash. There's also fears about the destruction of national culture. As I mentioned earlier, immigration was one of the massive drivers of the Brexit vote. But curiously, the advertisements about immigration that were used to motivate people did not show pictures of Europeans in the United Kingdom. They showed pictures of Muslims. They showed people who actually had come from the wider British Commonwealth or who were um, fleeing from war in North Africa or the Middle East. That immigration from asylum seekers from people who are rushing away from economic hardship and from other parts of the British Commonwealth, that's not going to dissipate with Brexit. What's going to dissipate with Brexit is the fact that you won't have quite so many French bankers in London and you won't have quite so many Polish waiters. But the immigration that really seems to bother people in the United Kingdom, that immigration has always been in the hands of the United Kingdom and continue, will continue to be. But there is whether it's in the United Kingdom or if you look around the United States, 
there is a, a massive fear that a national culture that people have taken for granted for so long, that that national culture is being diluted and that there is a need to push back against further dilution. Economic dislocation and inequality. Globalization, of course, has delivered massive benefits when you look at GDP statistics, but when you look at income inequality, when you look at the share of benefit going to wealth as opposed to going to income, you see that right around the world there are places that have been completely left behind. Whether those places are Sunderland and Newcastle and Birmingham or Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. There are places that are being left behind because a comfortable consensus has settled amongst the elite politicians of the centre-left and the centre-right where they care much more about what the coasts think they care much more about what the metropolitan centres think, and they have largely ignored what's going on in the Rust Belt areas of the UK, of Germany, of the United States. There has been a dealignment in political identification and voting behaviour. Whether you're talking about the Reagan Democrats, or you're talking about all of the former mining communities in the United Kingdom that are about to vote Conservative, which is remarkable to think that communities that still have in their muscle memory a hatred of Margaret Thatcher and everything they think their, her policies did to their communities, they're going to now opt for a more right-wing version of conservatism on Thursday. And that is because there has been a general breaking down in alignment traditionally um, with political classes. And whereas in the United Kingdom you could historically tell how someone would vote based on the class they come from, working class voting, labour, middle to upper class is voting for conservative, now on Thursday, the greatest indicator of how someone will vote is whether they're a Leaver or a Remainer. The impact of new media, by which I mean social media, and by which I mean what I call poisonous media, and I won't name any names, and of course the infiltration of foreign governments into our media uses. Just as there has been evidence to suggest the election of 2016 was interfered with by the Russians. There is plenty of evidence to suggest that the, election, that the Brexit referendum suffered similar sorts of misinformation and that the current general election is suffering from current misinformation. It's notable that the press and the political parties in the UK have asked the government to release its own intelligence assessment as to whether there is foreign meddling in British democratic processes going on right now. They are sitting on a report and they're refusing to release that report. And then the importance of leadership, and I want to close with this slide. And I'm calling this the Corbyn parable. I have an argument to make that Brexit would not have happened if Labour was led by another leader. And I have an equally strong argument to make that the election result on Thursday would not be a Conservative win if Labour had another leader. If Labour had somebody of the calibre of the politicians that worked for Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, those politicians would have, what's the expression in the United States? They would have handed Theresa May her lunch and then they would have handed Boris Johnson his dinner. But what has happened is that the Labour Party opted for a political leader who is even less liked and even less trusted than the incumbent in 10 Downing Street. They've opted for someone who is too far to the left of where the majority of the population of the country sits. They've opted for somebody who, even though he was a lifelong sceptic of the European Union, tacitly supported Remain, but didn't really advocate for Remain. As I mentioned earlier, a Marxist or a lying buffoon, people have said the lying buffoon. The reason why this is really, really important is because in the United States, if you take for granted that President Trump is going to be voted out of office because of Ukraine or because of Russia, or because of failure to build a wall, or for any other reason, you're living in fantasy land. Because a lot of what happens with President Trump is going to be dependent upon who is the alternative. And right now in the United Kingdom, this is the alternative, and therefore we're going to get an increased majority for the Conservative Party. So when we're thinking about what happens in the United, in, in the United States next year, the first thing we have to do is remember these lessons and do not leave the left behind behind again. Do not respond to what the Twitter sphere is asking for because the Twitter sphere does not live in reality. And make sure that the alternative that is being proposed is palatable and electable. Because if that doesn't happen, there will be four more years. Now, for many people, that may or may not be a problem. But for me, given what I work on, it's disaster. 
because on climate change we have scientifically established 10 years in order to solve this problem, which means we do not have the luxury of another four years of President Donald Trump. So if we fail to look at what's going on in the United Kingdom, and if we fail to harvest those lessons, and if we follow the same mistakes, then look out for a different photo. I won't say who in particular, but there will be a different photo, and we will be having the same sort of conversation, but about the US election. My own particular feeling, and this is my last comment, is that I am an Anglophile, even though I'm from Ireland. I'm a Europhile. I spent my career in the European Union. I very much wanted the United Kingdom to stay in the European Union, but I have changed my mind because the reality is Brexit is going to take a generation to fix. The level of toxicity, the level of tribalism and polarization is such that the United Kingdom is going to spend years, if not decades, trying to knit itself back together because of this issue. And the rest of Europe, because of all of the challenges that are faced, doesn't have the luxury of being able to hold the British hands while this is going on. So reluctantly, people like me are now of the opinion that it's actually time for the UK to leave. Withdraw honorably, solve your problems separately, and when the moment comes and you realize that it's better in than out, you'll be welcomed back in with open arms. Thank you very much. Now, any questions, any disagreements, I welcome them all. Please. Could I ask two questions? Yes, yes please. One between the uh, Northern and, and uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland, that was religious, right? That was like Protestant and Catholic um, battles over the years. It's more complicated than that. It? It's more complicated than that. I think that religion, of course, plays a huge factor. The initial conflict began with what was called the plantation, which meant that a Catholic population living in that territory was moved out of that territory, forcibly displaced, and the land instead was given to soldiers who were Protestants who had fought for a Protestant king. So there's a reason why my family originally come from Northern Ireland. My name is Cameron. That's a Scottish name. And the reason why you have Scottish people living in Northern Ireland is a consequence of what was called the plantation. Now that goes back a very, very long way. More recently, religion played a role because when Ireland was partitioned in the 1920s, a state was created in Northern Ireland that was controlled exclusively by a very sectarian Protestant denomination. And they put in place all manner of policies that restricted housing and jobs and economic development opportunities for Catholics. So the troubles began actually with human rights marches in the 1960s with Catholics arguing that they should have the same human rights as the Protestant community. Those human rights marches were hijacked by a Republican movement who didn't care necessarily about human rights, but cared more about national identity. They wanted the reunification of Ireland. It was hijacked, and unfortunately, people like me grew up in the south of Ireland over the course of my lifetime, feeling very much ashamed of my own national flag because I would only ever see it on the coffins of terrorists after they'd blown up civilians. So it's partly about religion, but it's also partly about, do you see yourself as British or do you see yourself as Irish? And if you see yourself as Irish, you want reunification. And if you see yourself as British, you want to remain part of the United Kingdom. Now, what was the wonderful solution? We don't have to see ourselves as British or Irish. We could see ourselves as European. So one of the reasons why I gravitated to work for the European Union is because I could leave all of that nationalism behind. I didn't have to choose, I could decide that the European flag and the values that it represents is the flag that represents me. But once the United Kingdom leaves the European Union, that's no longer an option for people. Hmm. Can I just ask you one other short question? I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, looking at candidates for the Democratic candidates for 2020, I just have to get excited for me. I have to get excited about a candidate. And I know what you're saying. You, you know, you look at the candidate for if you're not for Trump, like I am, it's going to beat Trump. Um, so can I ask you who you think that person is? There you go. Your spot. <laughs> hmm. Because I do think about that. And then I also think about the fact that I have to get excited about somebody. It's not just, well, who can be Trump? Yeah. I, I, look, the honest answer is I really don't know. I think it's too early to tell. Uh, yeah. I, I really do. I mean, I'm, I'm personally not terribly excited about any of them, but I'm excited about any of them enough that I would want them rather than Trump. Mm -hmm. 
So my only piece of wisdom, if you can call it that, is I think too many people in 2000 decided to vote for Ralph Nader rather than cast their vote for Al Gore. I think too many people in 2016 decided to stay at home rather than vote for Hillary Clinton. I think too many Bernie Sanders fans decided that Hillary was just the same as Donald. I'm afraid she's not. You might dislike Hillary Clinton. You might think she does not go far enough. I don't personally think that being guarded and secretive is the same as being a liar, but people were able to categorize her as that. So my only advice is whoever is on the ballot, everybody has to throw their support wholeheartedly behind that person. Now, one of the things that I feel uh, strongly about um, is, and this is going to sound ageist, excuse me for that, but I'm really tired of old white men. I really am. When I saw the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, and I say this all the time, and people in the room have heard me say this before, no disrespect, but Patrick Leahy has been a senator since before I was born, and I'm 44. Yeah. Oh, yeah. On every single issue area, we need a change of leadership. We need new voices. That doesn't mean Pete Buttigieg should be your person. I don't think the mayor of South Bend is qualification enough to be the, the head of the armed services and in charge of the largest economy in the world. But, but I, I do think that there's a real problem that the only top tier candidates within the race are all in their 70s. I really think that that's a failure to incubate the next generation of leaders. That's one of the reasons that you would judge. You can think I'm a speedy so damn smart, but anyway. Smart is not enough, I think. I think yeah. you, need, you need to be more than smart, but anyway. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer because I personally have not made up my own mind yet. Please. So you mentioned that the, all the former prime ministers are saying don't vote for Boris Johnson. Does that mean they're saying vote Labour? No, it's more complicated than that. So are you saying to who to vote for? Because you don't have a choice. If you want to remain, it seems like you have to vote for a former. Well, no. So for example, Tony Tony Blair has encouraged people to vote tactically, and. Even John Major has said, don't vote for Boris, but he has also said, don't vote for Corbyn. He's suggesting that you vote for, for example, those people who were conservatives, who've now been kicked out of the conservative party and are running as independents. So one of the things that they're doing is they're suggesting that Boris Johnson looks like he's on track for a majority. And you must make sure he doesn't get a majority. Because if there's a hung parliament with a minority government, then parliament comes back into play, trading can happen within parliament, and maybe a good deal can be, can be settled upon. So they're not, they're not backing Corbyn. What are, the, what are the Liberal Democrats? What's their position? So they have completely misjudged the public mood, in part, I think, because they have a, a new leader who is very young and very inexperienced. She had a position that was very reasonable. Her position was, we would like to have a second referendum. Three years later, we know more than we knew before. We now have a deal which we didn't have before. Therefore, we know what Brexit actually means, which we didn't know before. So let's have another referendum. A very sensible <coughs> position. But at the beginning of the campaign, she decided to jettison that view and say instead, no, what we're going to do if we form a majority government is revoke Article 50. In other words, we're going to decide unilaterally to stay in the European Union without putting the question back to the British population. And as a consequence, their poll numbers have completely tanked and they're now hovering around 13%. So she's made that mistake. Jeremy Corbyn's mistake is that he never seems to be able to make up his mind what his viewpoint on Brexit actually is. Because on the one hand, he doesn't want to lose votes in leave areas that traditionally send a Labour MP to Parliament. So he wants to hedge his bets there. But on the other hand, he knows that he can't increase his numbers in Parliament without appealing to Remain voters. So his position for the last number of years has been almost impossible for Labour spokespeople to articulate. Whereas Boris is very clever. Get Brexit done. It might not be truthful, but it's easy to remember. Please. Yeah. Um as I understand it, the, the Brexit referendum was concocted at the pizza parlor at O'Hare <coughs> Airport solely by Cameron because he was afraid of the UKIP party mm -hmm. and losing right-wing votes to the UKIP party. So he came up over a, uh, um, I think it was a, 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 a plain Pizza. An Italian dish, nonetheless. Yeah, that's right. He, he came up with the idea um, for Brexit. Mm -hmm. But everybody disagreed. I mean, everybody around the table disagreed with when he got 
back to London, everybody disagreed with it and felt it was foolhardy to take such a serious issue, um, complicated issue, mm -hmm. to the public. I would say that that's, that was the genesis of what we have now. I would, and he's now teaching leadership courses at uh, oh, no, elite Ivy League schools. I couldn't believe that. Yeah, I, it is absolutely true. That's that's how it happened. He and and to be fair, he did reap an electoral reward for it because he formed a minority government in coalition in 2010. Right. Because of this promise, arguably, he won a majority in 2015. No, I, I, I think that was. I, I felt that he wouldn't have lost the vote to the UK. Yeah. If he had gone without the referendum, he still would have. Uh, Either way, he did make that choice for all the reasons you suggested, and uh, you know that's why I often talk about it as a failure, a, an act of vandalism caused by vanity, because it was also not just Boris's vanity wanting the leadership, it was his own vanity of wanting to end what had been a major fracture in the Conservative Party for decades. Please. You, you dropped this little uh, uh, bomb that um, uh, the British government is carefully studying Russian intervention in this election, but they're refusing to release the, the report. What's that all about? So there is a report that the British government is in possession of that details an intelligence assessment about the scale of foreign meddling in the UK democratic system. Now, I don't want to place um, malign intent on the British government. There may be part of this calculus that relates back to the so-called Comey moment, that you don't want to release something and then affect the outcome of the re election. So part of the argument that they're making is, we can't release this information in the middle of a general election. On the other hand, if you don't have transparency and you don't release the report, then you leave enough grounds for all of the opposition parties to say you are covering up what is essentially Russian interference to sway our, our vote just as they, I don't think they swayed the vote actually in, in 2016, but you're, you're covering up that, that, that interference. So that is out there, that's sitting there, and obviously it's now too late to release, uh, release the report because the election is in two days. But it's, it's a major problem as far as I'm concerned that they refuse to re release that, that report, major problem. Please. Um, if I had been in UK at the time of the referendum, <clears throat> I would have voted Remain. <clears throat> Not because I understand the economic situation, but because I come from a military background mm -hmm. and I understand the security situation. Mm -hmm. And as you said <clears throat> earlier on, and you showed that uh, um, um, picture, uh, Europeans <clears throat> have been fighting each other for hundreds of years. <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, they have learnt that lesson. Uh, and Germany, uh, at the moment, is being accused by Trump of not spending enough on defence. That's true. But they're spending money on social issues. And deliberately, under Chancellor Merkel, is not spending money. Now, in, you have Poland, you have Hungary, you have the AFD in Germany <coughs> rising, <coughs> and you have Italy. Um, uh, the concern I have uh, uh, is that whilst the uh, present generation that remembers the horrors of World War II uh, remain alive, uh, that's fine. But unfortunately, we human beings have this weakness of forgetfulness. Uh, and uh, I'm, I am personally concerned uh, that it, 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 who knows what this might lead to mm -hmm. in the end. Uh, and the UK to step away from uh, uh, Europe uh, is a mistake for that reason. Um, I have just come back from a, a week in Berlin, uh, and I'm very impressed by Berlin, uh, who seem to have been coming to terms with their history uh, really rather successfully. But that's because Chancellor Merkel and that generation have been there. If the generation of the uh, AFD and the, and, the, and the others take over, and, and so I'm, if I would, was, uh, 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 had a chance now, I'm, I would even vote even more to remain. Uh, uh, that's my comment. It's not a question, it's a comment. Yep. And I agree with you. If the first part of my uh, presentation could be summed up in one phrase, it would be, you don't know what you're leaving and you don't know what you're damaging. 
because that's the reality of the situation, I think. People don't take enough time to understand our history. And as a consequence of losing that memory, we can do real damage. There's a wonderful book on the First World War called The Sleepwalkers. And I recommend it as reading for anybody in the room, not just because it's about the First World War, but it's about how seemingly innocuous missteps and miscalculations can lead to the death of millions. It's not the same as the Holocaust where you have a fanatical regime. There's very little difference as far as I'm concerned, having read up on this, between the different powers in the First World War. There wasn't one side that was evil and one side that was good, to be very blunt about it, but there was miscalculations and missteps that took us down a terrible road. And right around the world, I actually think we're living in very, very dark times right now because we're making a series of missteps, not knowing where that's going to take us. And that's why, for example, for me, the European Union is not less important today than it was 10 years ago. It's more important. Yeah, yeah. Please. Um, I just have a comment as well. From a medical standpoint, <clears throat> the collaboration of scientists and medical people certainly can produce something that's much better than each you know, country doing it, or the United States versus the EU. And I was a recipient of something that came out of Germany. Mm -hmm. And I know that it was, well, it was a, like a trial jump for a long time, but it was something that was a collaborative, and, and I thought to myself, anytime, then I thought to myself, anytime you can get collaboration, you've got all minds working in the same, as opposed to, you know, splintered factions mm -hmm. of scientists and healthcare. Um, researchers and stuff. I don't know. I, I mean, that's and that, that's under threat. So within the yeah. EU, you have various programs. One is called Socrates, one is called Erasmus, that allows young college students to take a year and go to a college in another part of the EU. Very important in terms of building their capabilities, but also very important in terms of building bonds of trust across nationalities. And then you have a program called Horizon 2020, which puts massive amounts of money into centers of excellence and learning right across the EU and, for example, means that the University of Heidelberg collaborates with the University of Cambridge on biotechnology. The UK is separating itself from all of that, which means British students will not be able to involve themselves in those programs and British research institutions will lose out on that funding and will lose out on those collaborations. And they lose all that knowledge. And that's a problem, yeah. <laughs> Am I understanding your final comment to say that you now support leaving yes. I don't, I don't support leaving. If I were in the UK right now, yeah. I would be voting tactically for a party that will keep a Johnson majority either very low or would ensure that there's no Johnson majority. And if I was given the choice in another referendum, I would vote to remain. But I'm not British. So not being British, now putting on my European hat, uh, I, I really fear that this is not something that's resolved with a second referendum because the vote was so close the first time around the second vote would be equally close and if there was now a second vote that voted for remain you wouldn't sit um, overnight simply get those leave supporters to go away you wouldn't simply change their mind they wouldn't simply wake up the next morning and say oh you know what you were right all along we shouldn't have left the european union <laughs> any more than you're going to suddenly get a donald trump voter waking up tomorrow and deciding that you know what a wall is a bad idea so I just don't see that this is something that's going to be resolved in the short term. And because we have so many other pressing issues, and I would almost, you know, going back to the medical metaphor, it's almost like avoiding contagion. There's a very severe risk that some of the dispute and toxicity in the United Kingdom on this issue right now becomes contagious elsewhere. And I think it's almost important now that we let them go their own way and, and deal with this issue and then come back at a later date. So that's the conclusion I've come to. I just, I, th I think they're beyond remaining. And as a consequence of being beyond remaining, I think it's important that the separation is handled well and, and honorably and with minimal damage. And it breaks my heart to say that, it honestly does, but I, I, that's not, not, not the view of my heart, it's the view of my head at this point. Thank you.